Despite popular belief, the public doesn't actually find out about new dinosaurs a week or two after they're dug up. In fact, the excavation, both in the field and in the lab, can take anywhere from weeks to months to even years. And that's before the specimen has even been studied and a publication has been made. As a result, findings are often made public years after they've been found. Sometimes, though, something slips through the cracks and we get a whiff of a new unofficial dinosaur. Or even scientists will hesitantly describe a specimen without assigning it to a new genus, such as with today's case, the Kenyan Giants. All the way back in 2013, an indeterminate specimen was announced during the 73rd annual meeting of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, with the name of the Kenyan giant being coined by a volunteer at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. This specimen was found in, you guessed it, Kenya, specifically the Lapur Mountains of northwest Turkana, and consists of unspecified fragments of the skull, torso and limbs. The initial focus was on certain skull features, as well as the size, which we'll get back into. Given the lack of assignment to a given species, genus, or even a subfamily, the Kenyan giant is one that has a few nicknames instead. The aforementioned, along with the Turkana gritsabellosaurid, the Turkana giant, or a more popular name given that many have informally assigned the specimen to a genus and species, Titanovenator kenyensis. Since it wasn't released with an adequate description, this makes the name Anomen nudum, or naked name, and it doesn't necessarily mean that this is what it will be called if and when it has been officially described. But despite that, I like having an actual genus to refer to, so I'll be using mostly Titanovenator for this video. So the question is, how do we go about finding out what Titanovenator actually looked like with such scant remains? Well, there's a great method used in paleontology that gives us the correct answer more often than it doesn't, and that is known as phylogenetic bracketing or when you cut out the jargon, just means taking an educated guess. So let's start off with what we do know. Titanovenator was most definitely an abelosaurid, given that the proportions and textures of the partial skull roof and maxillary bones suggest what is so characteristic of this group, and that is a proportionately short, wide and deep skull, along with a rugose texture along the brow ridges, sometimes ending in horn-like structures such as in Carnotaurus. Now, the extent of the limb findings weren't elaborated on much, but assuming that they were typical of an abelosaurid, these probably would have made T-Rex a lot less self-conscious about its inability to clap. Abelosaurids were the most extreme in terms of short arms, often being made up of a single bone, lacking an elbow altogether and simply facing mostly backwards. What they did have over other theropods, though, were a surprising amount of digits. Despite how appearingly vestigial they were, these little things actually usually have four digits on their hands instead of three or two, but most, if not all, were just little nubs rather than claws. What also seems strange is that most abelosaurids seem to have shoulder girdles much larger than most other theropods, along with a high degree of flexibility at the shoulder joints. An apparent lack of usefulness of the forelimbs below that joint led paleontologists to surmise something that was famously immortalized in a funny but not improbable scene in prehistoric planets, in which the Carnotaurus does a fun little dance for a prospective mate. Now this isn't to say that Titanovenator did this, or that it even had the exact same proportions shared by other abelosaurids in this department, but members of a group will often share traits and there's nothing yet to say that Titanovenator didn't have that. Beyond that we can assume the usual stiff and straight theropod tail, but the leg length is something that we can't be sure about. Tintabellosaurids show a huge amount of variation in the length of their legs and by proxy their potential land speed. For those that might not know, one of the fastest theropods for their size was Carnotaurus. But this family does also include members on the opposite end of the scale that have proportionately short legs. There's no way of guessing which side it might fall upon without further information. Speaking of size, another thing announced was the size estimates that were extrapolated from these remains. Now given the variation in leg length among abelosaurids, a hip height is unfortunately close to impossible to predict. But a total length of the animal was given as 11 to 12 meters 36 to 39 feet, potentially making it approximately three tons and the largest known abelosaurid. Now this kind of size doesn't mean that it could bully a T-Rex, but it does put it on par with the likes of Saurophaganax, which despite not being an official genus anymore, I do talk about here, and that's certainly not a size to be sniffed at. 
Now from this information and data collected from the formation in general, we might be able to take a few guesses as to how Titanovenator was living in this environment. Now the Lapeur sandstone in which this seropod was found actually crosses the threshold of the KPG boundary, being deposited between 72 to 65 million years ago. Obviously Titanovenator came from the earlier parts of this, likely existing within the last 7 to 8 million years of the Cretaceous. Given the much higher sea levels at this time, this formation shows a mixture of shallow marine and fluvial environments. Though no plant material has been found, it's likely that much of these were swampy mangroves, with brackish rivers leading out to sea. Since this formation crosses the famous KPG boundary, quite the mixture of fossils have been found from here, but it isn't exactly rich in dinosaur fossils, perhaps partly due to the heavily aquatic nature of the formation. Found here have been abundant but indeterminate drysaurid and turtle remains, along with an indeterminate mosasaur. But as we hit land, we see three indeterminate sauropods, two indeterminate iguanodontids, along with some sort of third ornithopod, along with two indeterminate theropods alongside Titanovenator, though one of these have been tentatively speculated to be a Spinosaurus. So the Kenyan giant isn't the only one that's shrouded in mystery, it seems that the whole ecosystem is. But I do want to stay on those dinosaurs, however indeterminate they are, just to make a quick comparison. The fauna and some of the paleo conditions show quite a few similarities to the Baharia formation, famous mostly for giving us Spinosaurus itself. It's a bit of a stretch, but if the conditions and ecological relationships were similar, we can take some guesses into how Titanovenator might have lived by comparing it to Baharia's Abelosaurid, known as... Oh for f sake! Okay, I'm just going to have to admit that this area just needs a hell of a lot more study on top of the Kenyan giant. So, whilst we're twiddling our thumbs waiting for that, let's answer today's question, which comes from Jurassic Cannon King, who's asked, What do we know about how pterosaurs are related to archosaurs in general, and is there any evidence of similar flyers in the Permian? You have actually read my mind for one of the next entries on my Everything You Need to Know series. Uh, this is where I walk you through an entire group in each video, but we can have a little sneak peek now. So pterosaurs actually do fall within the clade of Archosauria, a group split into roughly two groups, the Pseudosuchia, or all crocodilians and their closest relatives, and the Avometatarsalia, or dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and all of their closest relatives. You may or may not have heard the term Ornithodira in relation to pterosaurs and dinosaurs due to the fact that this was considered synonymous with Avometatarsalia, but it is now considered a clade within Avometatarsalia and does pretty much include dinosaurs, pterosaurs and their closest relatives. The problem of establishing what within Ornithodira they are more related to is slightly more difficult than usual, since pterosaurs' anatomy has been so heavily modified for flight, but it's thought that they initially diverged from Lagopetids somewhere in the late Triassic. So to summarise their relationship with other archosaurs, you essentially have the Avometatarsalia, a sister group to the Pseudosuchia, and then within that you have Aphanosaurs and the Ornithodira, which you can pretty much say consists of Pterosauromorphs and Dinosauromorphs. In terms of previous flyers, pterosaurs were actually the first vertebrates in Earth's history that we know of that developed powered flight, so any true flyers from the Permian were in fact arthropods. But reptiles were certainly starting to show some signs of attempting flight, mostly in the form of gliding. Gliding reptiles from the Permian include Wygeltosaurids and Cuaniosaurids, but most of the gliding reptiles that were around before the pterosaurs were from the early Triassic, really diversifying in the wake of the Permian mass extinction. Anyway, I hope that's answered your question because I really appreciate you submitting that and if you have a question that you'd like me to answer, head over to my community tab where you find the relevant post where you can put the question in. Alternatively, you can sign up as a patron and one of the benefits that you get is being able to message me directly with your question and have it take top priority. Otherwise, I really appreciate you watching until the end of this video and I will catch you guys next time.